for sin. But it points to something greater. It, it points to the end of the world when judgment will come one day to all nations here on this earth. And that will happen one day when God will judge. And it's coming. And it's interesting that in the 30 years that I have been a Christian, there, it, there has been waves uh, of men and, and ministries that have spoken about the end being very near. And there's been years where everyone's talking about it because of what's going on in the world. And it just seems to be the hot topic of the day. And then all of a sudden it dies out and no one's talking about it at all. And so they're waiting for the next thing. They're, they're just kind of going along and getting in the word. And then all of a sudden again, things start happening in the world and it wakes us up. And we realize, wait a minute, these are things that are happening today that, that correlate with the scripture. And boy, is the end here again? And God just seems to remind us that judgment is coming. And, and you can... You, you can know that God is faithful to keep his promise. That's what I love about the word of God. It's been tried and proven. When, when you do a little history and research on it, you will find that, that the, the history, archaeologically, the evidence is there. And if you knew this, but um, uh, the Philistines, they just found uh, the city where Goliath uh, lived. And so they've excavated there in Israel, and it is a historical site. It has Philistine people that live there, and they have all the artifacts and so forth. So this is a history book, and, and there's evidence to show that it did exist. There was a time where Pontius Pilate, the, um, the critics were saying, see, we don't even have any record whatsoever of Pontius Pilate, so the Bible isn't true. You can't depend on it. And then we find a plaque that's right there in Caesarea, right in the ocean, uh, as they built and excavated this great city, where Herod had built, and if you go out into the ocean and, and dig further, they actually found tile out there, and, and they found a plaque there that said Governor Pontius Pilate, and so the evidence is there, and again, the critics just don't say anything because they were wrong, but they don't want to let everyone know that they were wrong, so they just don't say anything, and they just continue to do that. They just found the city of David a couple of years ago, more of the city of David. Uh, they're locating the, uh, the temple itself, and where it's at, and they're finding that the temple is, is really not where the mosque is, but it's a little bit to the south of the mosque. And so, again, the understanding by the theologians is that there's a possibility that, that the temple will exist right next to the mosque. And so we have the site ready, it's ready to be built, and then uh, if when it is built, that's when the Antichrist will be shown and the end will come. So the evidence is there with the Bible. I mean, it's just very clear. And, and then there's the textual criticism uh, in that art of criticizing a book or a writing um, they criticize it by the text itself they look at the text and, and they see for consistencies they see for character uh, of the writer they, they look for um, words that are constantly being used by the writer in a certain way and so they can determine that there's one writer that's writing a letter and they can determine by other letters that it's the same writer because they compare them textual criticism and as they comparing compare them they know that these uh, writings are from this writer um, I would write differently than you write and you would write differently than anyone else writes. As you can tell, my, my language is not as, as precise as a lot. And so I would write that way and you would know, oh, that's Pastor Reuben. I know how he talks. I know how he writes. Because you'll just be able to, to see that, I think, in just with common sense. So when you look at the text, and this is what they've proven from Genesis to Re Revelation, there's one author. There's just one author. Uh, the text is very clear that one author wrote this, though the text itself says that God wrote it and he used men. He used men to pin it down on paper. And he put his spirit in them so that they would write these things down. And so again, even through textual criticism, uh, they find no, <clears throat> no problem with this being uh, the word of, of God. And so you have artifacts, you have uh, archaeology, you have textual criticism, you have history itself, and then you have prophecies. And, and that's my point this evening. Judgment's coming, and God says judgment is coming. And when he promises that something's coming, you can depend on it happening. That's a promise, and he doesn't lie. When you look at the prophecies, there are over 300 prophecies pertaining to Jesus's, Jesus coming at a certain time. And all 300 prophecies came true. The odds of that 
is like 10 to the 53 or beyond that, which is an impossibility. It's an impossibility. You would win the lottery before you could do something like that. That's how impossible it would be. And so the evidence is just there. The thing is, is do you accept that evidence? Do you believe that evidence? And if you do, then you have to believe that this is the word of God. And then accept it as the word of God and then begin to read it and apply it to your life. So God says judgment is coming for all the nations. This is the sixth part of Jeremiah's book. And so he has written five parts. And each of those parts, as you remember, Jeremiah doesn't go chronologically through uh, this whole event. He just kind of cuts history in certain places and then he just talks about them and then he moves on to another section and sometimes he refers back to the history of Judea there. So this is the writing, his last writing of these chapters here. We, we see from chapter 46 to 51, you could probably place them uh, right after chapter 25 in the Septuagint version. Jeremiah uh, concludes in chapter 52 with, with basically uh, the judgment on all of these, these nations. And in this chapter itself, chapter 45, we're going to deal with encouragement for uh, an assistant of Jeremiah, uh, a man that was supportive of Jeremiah, a man that was there for him, and a man that uh, feels that God is calling him to, to something more, but God is going to encourage him uh, in his walk, <clears throat> which I find interesting because uh, God is always working with everyone, not just the pastor. And not just with the assistant pastors and the elders and the deacons, but with the body of Christ. He has a purpose and a plan for all of us, and we need to remember that. But we also need to understand that it's his purpose and his plan and not ours. If we give our lives to Jesus Christ, then we are basically saying, Lord, we're giving you our life. Now you lead and guide us. That should be our desire. It shouldn't be our desire to be leading God. It doesn't work that way. That's not Christianity. When I was sharing with somebody about uh, my, one of my sons who, who was an architect, and earlier in my life, I wanted to be an architect. I started studying architecture in junior high and went through all the classes in junior high and then went to high school and took all the drafting classes and I did all those classes. Then I actually went to Mount Sac and I started my, my uh, junior college classes <clears throat> in architecture. And then all of a sudden some things happened, and I think they're godly divine, in my life where he started leading me to, uh, in another direction, where I went from architecture to electronics. Uh, because there was a need for my family, I needed to support them, and so I needed a job, and so all of a sudden I'm working for Southern California Edison, identifying material. And then while I'm there, I meet a couple of guys that are Christians, they tell me about the Bible, they give me a Bible, and they plant the seed. And then they help me get a job full-time as just an entry level uh, as a man with a wife and four boys or actually three boys at the time Roman was just coming uh, needed a job and they saw that and they they helped me that uh, to get that job and these were Christian men that planted that seed and then while working for Southern California Edison I get saved and the Lord saves me and all of a sudden my job is no longer as important as what God wants me to do my life changes, I start reading the Bible, I start sharing the word with others, I want to see people saved, I want them to understand that, that Jesus came for them, that he loved them very much, and that they too can have eternal life, it's just so simple that you just give your life to him and let him run it, and so when I did that, he just led me, and wherever he led me, I just walked, not knowing, not understanding, and I just did as much as I could as he led me, and all of a sudden, here I am a, a pastor. And so he leads you and he guides you. And if you're willing to be led and guided, he will lead and guide you. But if you're not, if you want to rule your own life, if you want to go your own way, he'll let you do that. But it's not going to be uh, his perfect will for your life. He has a perfect will for you and he also has a permissive will for you. And his perfect will, uh, that's where you want to be. You'll have all the rest and peace and he'll carry the load for you. But in his, per in his permissive will, in that he allows you to fulfill your own little plans, he will be there with you and he doesn't love you any less, but it will always be hard and difficult because you're not really submitted and surrendered to him. And so <clears throat> we're going to see that as we go through that they're being judged because of this idolatry and they weren't willing to submit totally to God. So God promises safety here to uh, Barak. 
Breck had or will have an experience uh, and uh, a difficult time during this war that is taking place, but God is going to assure him that he has a work for him. Look at verse 1. The word of, that Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Barak the son of Neri, uh, when he had written these words in a book at the instruction of Jeremiah in the fourth year at Jehokim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying... Now, this is a personal message to Barak from the Lord. Um, he has a word for him. Have you ever had a personal message from God? What a neat thing to have a personal message from God to you. God does have a personal message for you. He has a personal message every day for you. Uh, he has had a personal message for me since day one. Every time I read his word, it is a message to me. And he has spoken to me so many times through his word. He doesn't need to speak to me in a voice. He doesn't need to speak to me in some supernatural way. He speaks to me through his word. And his word speaks very loudly to me. And it's him personally speaking to me. I, I love it when he does that. I remember one time going to a pastor's conference. And when I got back home, um, I happened to be um, studying Genesis at the time in my devotions. And talking about uh, Abraham and his faith in, in leaving the land of Ur and going into the land of Canaan and God promised him all uh, the land in that area and he did this by faith and God was really ministering to me about walking by faith and just trusting him for my life and then when I came home and I was telling Virginia just about my devotions and so forth and how I sat right there uh, at Lake Tahoe and it just overlooked the lake and it was just really surreal and I just it was just so much peace and God ministered to me about faith and then she said, come here, I want to show you something. And so she took me to the calendar. And right there on the calendar for that month was a picture of Lake Tahoe right where I sat looking out from that view. And it was just like, wow. It's like God was just there. He spoke to me very loudly. You were right where I wanted you to be. And you were learning exactly what I wanted you to learn. And God speaks to us that way. You have to look for it, though. It means you have to really say, Lord, speak to me. I, I want to hear your voice. I want to hear you through your word. I want to know that it's you. He doesn't mind that at all. He loves that because then when he proves himself to you and he speaks to you, you'll know that it's him. But if you go through life not even asking, not even praying for it, he's not going to. You have to desire it completely. So this is a personal message to him. So he says, Thus says the Lord God of Israel to you, Barak, you said, Woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sign, and I find no rest. So, so you see his heart. He sees the war going on. He sees him possibly going into Egypt. Um, he doesn't see any real hope, and so his soul is, is sorrowful. He doesn't know what's going on for his life. He wants to do something wonderful, something great. And he doesn't know how God is going to, to use him. And that's fine. Uh, many of us might be there. Uh, we might even be trying to make a decision and we're wondering, okay, what is God going to do? How is he going to do it? You know, how he's going to take care of it. Uh, there comes a point in time where you know that God is involved and that you can trust him completely. When I got the word on Tuesday that they weren't going to have the walls for the canopy, that meant we couldn't cook and that meant no free food for the people. And, and I just said, Lord, this is not my problem. This is your problem. This is your event. And you're in charge. And so you're going to have to do something. And I could have got all frantic -y. I was like around 3.30 when I found out. And I could have started calling people. And just, you know, I called uh, Roman and said, put this on the prayer chain. Just send it out real quick. Have everyone start praying. And just, Lord, this is your, your problem. I woke up the next morning. Got on the, onto uh, Google, started looking up some places. First one didn't have it. Second one, boom, right here in Compton. Get it overnight. And so we just got it today. So, so we have it. And, and it was just like God took care of it. I didn't have to worry about it. And when you know that God does those things, you don't have to worry about it. It's only three days, though, from the event itself. And so you can worry uh, yourself to death sometimes. And, and usually that was is what happens when you're a young believer and you really want to see something happen. Just trust in God. It may be right at the last moment, but that is so exciting to see God at the last moment. Just step in and boom, you got exactly what you needed. God is good that way. And so God's going to uh, take care of this guy. Thus you shall say to him, thus says the Lord, behold, what I have built, I will break down. And what I have planted, I will pluck up. Th that is the whole land. So talking about the judgment and the war that's coming. 
And he's saying, look, I'm God. You're not. And whatever I built, I can also tear down. That's my prerogative as God. Uh, We tend to forget that, that God is sovereign. That's the word that we use, sovereign. In other words, his will will take place. Uh, We're nobody. We are nobody compared to God. And God's will is far greater than our own will as we walk this earth. I always imagine um, Shirley MacLaine, she had wrote a book uh, years ago. She was a new ager and she was talking about how we are God's. And so uh, someone used an analogy of her because in her book she writes about telling God that you're God. And so just scream out, I'm God. And if you believe this, you can change your life, you can change your destiny, you you can be whatever you want to be if you just believe it. And so she suggested that you scream it out, I am God. I am God. And you look in the mirror, I am God. Yeah. Yeah, I'm God. I can do it. Yeah, yeah. And this guy was using an analogy. Can you imagine God looking at that? God in heaven, the earth is his footstool. And there's Shirley McCain. I am God. And God goes, angels, come over here. Look down there. What's going on? Well, listen. I'm God. I'm God. I'm God. Do you hear it? No, I can't hear it. We'll get a little closer. I'm God. I'm God. (laughs) And God's going, she thinks she's God. (laughs) No, our God is far bigger than we are. There's, there's no way that we will ever be God himself. Look at verse five. You see his heart here. Um, and do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them. For behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh, says the Lord, but I will give your life to you as a prize in all places wherever you go. So apparently, he wants to do something big. Now, where is his heart and for what reason does he want to do something big does he want to be like jeremiah does he want to be well known does he want to be used that way it doesn't say but he wants to do something big something great and so god says don't seek to do things great don't seek to do things great i like that philosophy that's a philosophy that chuck has has taught us that you don't seek to be great you seek to lift jesus up And when you lift Jesus up, then all men will be drawn to him. Now, I can say personally that I tried to do something great when I started this ministry. I really thought that that I knew what I was doing because I had all the tools. I had all the training. God had, had led me to do what I was about to do in starting a Bible study and starting a church and so forth. Uh, he He put me through you know, the millstone in a sense. He, he trained me uh, with uh, the old church that I was a part of and so forth. So I thought, man, this is it. His hand is on me. I'm going to do something great. And I came in thinking that, but then nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened. Because he wanted to be the great thing in our church. And I was trying to create a great thing for his glory, but I was trying to create a, a great thing. That's a hard thing to understand. It's a principle that God uses uh, for us. It's not about us and what we do. See, we're not rewarded about the ultimate end. Uh, How successful were you? How great was your ministry? Uh, Is it like Greg Glories, where you have campuses all over Southern California? That's not what it's about. What it's about is how faithful are you with what God has given you. Now, what a great system. Think about that for a second, because it's not judged based upon your will be just as much as the one who is all over Southern California and has a great ministry, but was his heart in the right place? That's the question. Was he faithful with what God give, gave him? See, what we need to do is seek to just lift Jesus up. Just be in love with him. Just serve him. Whatever openings are there, you walk through them, you let him lead you and guide you, and you're faithful with it, and then he will begin to add to the church. Acts chapter four, or Acts chapter two is very clear. It's the Lord who adds to the church daily, not us. And it's the Lord's work in our lives. When I became a Christian, my, my hunger was so great for the Lord, I just started reading the word, started listening to radio, listening to Dr. Dobson. Dr. Dobson helped me through a lot. A Christian psychologist helped me raise my boys, uh, helped me to love my wife more. Just, I just started living it before them. And the outcome of all that, just living it and not looking for anything great, 
is that the Lord used us and people see the Lord in us. I messaged us, actually someone messaged me from high school just the other day and I've been trying to minister to this one guy who's an atheist <clears throat> and he just has a hatred for God and so this whole abortion thing we were on that subject and so I'm ministering to him trying to get to his heart you know and so forth and then she this this high school friend gets in there and she says a few things you know do you really believe this because that's ridiculous that you really believe that and she's not even a Christian and then all of a sudden I get this little message thing you know how you get a message a little private message and it's her so I read it and she goes are all our high school friends that stupid? <laughs> you know, she just tells me. And I'm, I'm kind of, I put a question mark and says, you got to love them. You know, then she goes, I know. And has got a little sad face on there. And so then I, I wrote back again and I, I said, yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, they're not all there. <laughs> you know, they really need the Lord. And, and, and I'm trying to just love them. You know me, I'm a believer. And I just want to love them. Now this gal, she's very intelligent. When she was in high school, and probably before that, her father made her read dictionaries with the definition. So she's very smart, very articulate, very witty. She puts stuff out there. And sh so I just kind of said, hey, I, I really enjoy your wit. I enjoy when you write on there. You know exactly what to say and so forth. And so I, I just wish I had half of your wit, you know. And she writes back. And I'm not patting myself on the back. Please don't, please understand this. Because only God can give you this type of love that people would see it. It's not me. And she goes, you and your wife have love. That's what she said. In other words, you don't need wit. You have love. And that love is so evident to the people on Facebook, all of your high school friends. And I was just like, wow. And I shared it with my wife. She goes, whoa, <laughs> that's, that's neat that God would do that. That's how it's done. When, when, when you just live it, then God will show those around you his spirit in your life. Just live it. Don't seek for great things. Just seek to be faithful with what God gives you and let him, let him determine uh, the greatness in your ministry. But he was seeking it. And God says, no, don't seek it. Um, he says, do not seek them. For behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh, says the Lord. But I will give your life to you as a prize in all places wherever you go. Now we come to chapter 46 and we begin uh, the last part of the book here on these judgments. It's a, it's a writing announcing God's judgment on all the foreign nations there in um, that area of Judah. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and start with uh, the judgment on Egypt. The word of the Lord which came to Jeremiah the prophet against all nations, against Egypt concerning the army of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, which was by the river Euphrates, and Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, defeated in the fourth year Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. Necho was, was a, a pharaoh of Egypt. And you remember that um, there was constant battles between Egypt, Assyrians, and the Babylonians. So they were constantly fighting and battling each other. And, and every so often... One would win, and they would become the ruling nations. And then all of a sudden, the other one would, would, would gain in force and power, and they would battle again, and all of a sudden, they became the ruling nations. So it was a constant battle. And as Jeremiah is writing here, he is writing during a time when Babylon has become a great nation. And through Babylon, when you read the book of Daniel, which is a good read, it, it shows you that, that Babylon became the last ruling nation. And from there, he gives us the image that he worshipped, which is a typology of, of the whole history of mankind, all the way to the judgment when you look at it. You can read it there in Daniel chapter, I believe, chapter 3 or 4. So Jeremiah is living during that time, as God is now judging all nations, including um, Egypt and the Assyrians. It says, order the buckler and the shield and draw near to battle. Her, uh, harness the horse and mount up, you horsemen. Stand forth with your helmets. Polish the spears. Put on the armor. Uh, why have I seen them dismayed and turned back? Their mighty ones are beaten down. They have speedily fled and did not look back. For fear was around them, saith the Lord. Again, uh, they're, right, they're fighting battle. They're gearing up for battle. And yet there's fear. They're running because of this uh, 
great horrific battle that's taking place, this judgment of God. Do not let the swift flee away, nor the mighty men escape. They will stumble and fall towards the north by the river Euphrates. Who is this coming up like a flood? Whose waters move like rivers? Uh, this, a typology of water, like a flood. It's talking about their armies. They're that big that they're just like waters flooding into the land. Egypt rises up like a flood and its waters move like rivers. And he says, I will go up and cover the earth. I will destroy the city and its inhabitants. Come up, O horse, and rage, O chariots, and let the mighty men come forth. The Ethiopians, uh, the Libyans who handle the shield and the Libyans who handle the and blend the, bend the bow. Uh, here it's speaking of Ethiopia, Egypt, who were neighbors uh, with Libya, who are also in this battle. So it, it, it's a, a battle that's taking place with all nations, and that's why it's referring to the end times, because one day uh, Israel will be that focus, as we see that today, and all nations will be focused at Israel, and they will attack Israel. Israel is a very important uh, part of the end times. There's a teaching, <clears throat> it's called replacement theology. I don't know if you've heard of it before. And it literally means what it says, replacement theology, a replacing of Israel. There are churches, Protestant churches, Christian churches, who believe that they are Israel. There's just some references in, in Romans that talks about uh, us being the church, a spiritual Israel, that we're, we're sons of God now. So God is done with Israel, and that's why there's a hatred towards Israel today. They believe that they crucified Jesus, and they should be judged and annihilated. There are a lot of Christian churches that are boycotting Israel, but that's not what t uh, Scripture teaches at all. Uh, they misunderstood the Scriptures completely. We are a spiritual is Israel, but we are also grafted in with Israel, as he tells us in John. So we're not the Israel, so that's a false doctrine, replacement theology. God is not done with Israel. They're, they're still the focus point, and we need to keep our eye on them. For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, uh, that he may avenge himself on his adversaries. The sword shall devour, it shall be uh, saturated and made drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts has a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. So that judgment, by the way, is God's judgment. There, there's a difference between judgments. <clears throat> there's God judgments, and there's judgments that take place between nations. You, you might think that the battle with Russia or the battle with Iran right now are, in a sense, judgments. So you might think that even disasters might be God's judgments, like Katrina or, or hurricanes and so forth. But those are not necessarily God's judgments. Those are natural disasters. God may may not be involved in it. We really don't know, uh, and we can't really say. But he could and he could not. But those are natural disasters. You know when God's judgment comes. God's judgment came when? The first time that God judged it was at the flood, right? That was the first judgment of God. You knew it was God's judgment because he said he was going to judge the earth because the earth was so corrupt that even the children and their imagination was beyond repair. And so he literally brought a flood on the earth. That is God's judgment. Sodom and Gomorrah, that is a judgment of God coming down on the earth. And so there is a difference. So when you're looking at the judgments, uh, be careful that you don't... Uh, uh, misunderstand that in the judgments. God's judgment comes and it will be to appease his wrath. It will be because he has been sinned against. And so he will have vengeance uh, against those who come against him. The nations have heard, verse 12, of your shame and your cry has filled the land for the mighty men have stumbled against the mighty. They both have fallen together. Now Babylon here will strike Israel in verse 13 on. The word that the Lord spoke to Jeremiah the prophet, how Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon would come and strike the land of Egypt. Declare in Egypt and proclaim in Migdal, proclaim in Nopt and Tepapathi. Say stand fast and prepare yourself for the sword devours all around you. So again, these are other cities there in that region that are going to be judged. Why are your valiant men swept away? They did not stand because the Lord drove them away. He made many fall, yes, one fell upon another. And they said, Arise, let us go back to our own people and to the land of our nativity uh, from the oppressing sword. They cry there, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, 
<clears throat> is but a noise. He has passed by the appointed time. As I live, saith the king, whose name is the Lord of hosts, surely as Tabor is among the mountains and as Carmel by the sea, so he shall come. O you daughter dwelling in Egypt, prepare yourself to go into captivity. For Noth shall be waste and desolate without inhabitants. Egypt is a very pretty heifer, but destruction comes. It comes from the north. Also her mercenaries are in her midst like fat bulls, for they, are, for they also are turned back. They have fled away together. They did not stand for the day of their calamity had come upon them, the time of their punishment. Her noise shall, be, shall go like a serpent, for they shall march with, any, with an army and come against her with axes like those who chop wood. They shall cut down her forest, says the Lord, though it cannot be searched because they are innumerable and more numerous than grasshoppers. The daughters of Egypt shall be ashamed. She shall be delivered into the hand of the people of the north. The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel says, Behold, I will bring punishment on Ammon of No and Pharaoh in Egypt with their gods and their kings, Pharaoh and those who trust in him. And I will deliver them into the hand of those who seek their lives, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and the hand of those servants. Afterwards it shall be inhabited as in the days of old, saith the Lord. God will preserve Israel. Now that's another promise there. God will preserve Israel. And to this day, God is preserving Israel. When we hear about Iran getting a nuclear weapon, and possibly destroying Israel. Well, we know that Israel will not be destroyed. The Bible's very clear. So we don't have to worry about that. Oh, what happens if they destroy it? They're not going to. It's not going to happen. God's already said that he won't. He's preserving them. And so they're going to be around even after the tribulation period. So we can be assured by the scriptures that Israel's going to be okay. There might be a lot of casualties and a lot of people may die, but Israel is going to be okay. They're not going to destroy it completely because God promised that he would preserve Israel. Very clear. Just as he promised to preserve the church. The same promise for Israel is for the church too. We'll be okay. No matter what is happening around us, we will be okay. God will be in our lives. He will direct us. He will guide us and he will lead us. And it gets to the point where it's so bad, then the rapture will take place and we'll be out of here. And we're before his presence for eternity. So praise God. His promises are true. <laughs> Those who have not accepted Jesus, though, will have to go through the tribulation period. And they will have to prove uh, this time that they truly love the Lord. We're living under grace. We don't have to prove anything because there's no persecution. God's judgment isn't here. We can proclaim to know Jesus and say it very clearly, but we can go on and just live our lives the way we want, which speaks louder than our words itself. But during the tribulation period, when you proclaim to be a Christian, you're going to have to live it. Because if you don't live it, if you don't live it, it will be evident that you're not living it. But if you do live it, you will probably more than likely be killed because of it. Whether it's through beheading or hanging, whatever, whatever form, a guillotine uh, that, that they're going to be using at that time. Because at that point, to say that you're a Christian, you will have to prove to the Antichrist, to the government, to the policing of, of system of that time that you are a Christian. And then you'll go to the presence of the Lord. So we're living under grace right now. And, and that's wonderful. But be careful that uh, we don't misuse that grace. That we don't live outside of God's will because we're only harming ourselves. Verse 27, do not fear O my servant Jacob, and do not be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from afar and your offspring from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return, have rest, and be at ease. No one shall make him afraid. So his promises are true. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, says the Lord, for I am with you, for I will make a complete end of all the nations to which I have driven you, but I will not make a complete end of you. I will rightly correct you, for I will not leave you wholly unpunished. So the correction of the Lord, Hebrews tells us that, right? We should, we should receive correction from the Lord. It's a good thing because it shows that we're believers and, and he's our father. But as you're receiving correction um, 
from the Lord, make sure that you receive it and you don't reject it. I've <clears throat> it's rare to see someone receive correction and receive it with, with great humility. I was just speaking with somebody that, that just left the church and just trying to get it at the heart of the whole issue and it went from from them listening to me and just trying to get them to understand and see what humility truly is to to don't you dare screaming and yelling at me and I don't know what I'm talking about. And it's just so interesting how when you confront someone on, on issues, they just won't receive the correction. There's no humility. You have to be humble to receive correction, right? Whether you're a child, whether you're an adult, that's what correction's all about. It's humbling you, telling you you're wrong. And so you need to look into this, you need to pray about it, you need to seek the Lord about these things so that you're right with the Lord because that's what it's all about. Proverbs says something about a rebuke. That a brother loves you when he rebukes you, right? It's a love. It has, it's nothing else but love. Trying to correct you so that you walk right with the Lord. And that's what correction is all about. If you're not being corrected, then the Bible says that you're not a son of God. In fact, it uses the word you're an illegitimate son, right? That means you're, you're not born into that family. It's like, it's like having a mother and father, but that's not your real mom. <laughs> it's somebody else. Is your mom and you just happen to have that dad. You know, you're illegitimate. No, we receive correction. We should desire correction. We should desire to grow uh, in our walk with the Lord. And so he's telling Israel, look, I love you. And, and I'm going to keep you. <laughs> no matter how bad you get. You're mine. And I'm going to correct you from time to time. And that's why this judgment is here. And it's not, this will not be the last one. It will happen again in AD 70 when... when uh, <clears throat> Nero comes in uh, from the Roman Empire and destroys the temple and takes all the gold and articles that, that Israel has and then disperses you again throughout the world. And that's where they lie to this moment. So there's hope in Israel and that's basically what verse 28 is talking about, the hope of Israel. There are brothers. There are brothers in, in God. They believe in the same God, yet they don't believe in Jesus. And they really need Jesus. But they believe in the same Father God that we believe in. Not like the Muslims who believe in Allah. He is not the same God that we believe in. Though the world will tell you that he is, but he's not at all. Do the research. Uh, that God is not the same God of our Bible. No matter what they tell you. Don't believe them. Do the research yourself. Now we come to chapter 47. Another writing of judgment against the Philistines. The Philistines were a, a very well-known uh, nation who was constantly fighting against Israel. You've all heard of the story of David and Goliath, right? And, and that whole battle there and how David slew Goliath, the great giant. And so now God is going to judge them here. It says, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet against the Philistines before Pharaoh attacked Gaza. The word Philistines occurs like 288 times. They were one of the worst enemies of Israel. They were constantly attacking them. The Philistines represents the flesh. They're the flesh in that it, they were always attacking Israel. Israel uh, representing the body, the church. Uh, the Philistines representing how the flesh is always there, always attacking always getting in the way. We always have to deal with it. Those were the Philistines. They were the flesh. And so like our flesh, we're always dealing with it. It's always getting in the way. It always wants what it wants and we need to crucify it. We need to battle against it. We need to murder it and so forth. And so God will finally one day deal with that flesh, right? When he does judge the world and we're in heaven, we will no longer have to deal with the flesh. Isn't that be wonderful? So all these feelings that we have that we know are wrong will be gone. All the responses that we also have that are negative or wrong, whether jealousy, whether envy, whether it's not even receiving rebuke or correction, all those things will be gone. It would be nice to finally think, <laughs> think correctly without having any of that emotional garbage from the flesh involved in it. 
I can't wait for that because there's such a battle with that. I don't know about you, but it's like you're always fighting. And it's like you want to just give up at times. Like, stop fighting with me. Why are you always there? Get out of the way. You know, I'm tired of this. And so you have to pray and seek the Lord and gain spiritual strength to battle it. But it's constant. And I can totally understand Paul when he said, boy, the things that, that I know that I should be doing, but yet I'm not doing them because the flesh is in the way. And yet the things that I know that I should not be doing, that are sin, that are wrong, why am I doing them? It's like, man. And then he even tells himself, oh, wretched man that I am. Uh, how many times have you done that? When you do something or you made a mistake or you've acted incorrectly and you're like, why do I do that? Why do I act that way? Why can't I do the right thing? And you know what the right thing is. And that's the flesh battling against you. And you need to take it back and pray and seek the Lord and ask him to give you the wisdom and how to do the right thing and the strength. And I love Paul because he ends that whole thing in chapter um, 8 of 1 Corinthians. And he, he, says, he, he basically says, look, I just thank God that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because you could easily feel condemned when you feel like that, right? Like, oh man, what kind of Christian am I? Am I even a Christian? Oh, I'm not even acting like a Christian. I'm so selfish, so self-centered, and I need to stop that. I'm like, boy, maybe I'm not saved after all. And Paul says, no, thank God that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. By the very fact that, that, that you're concerned about it is evident that you are a Christian and that you are saved. Because if you weren't, you wouldn't be concerned about it at all. You wouldn't care about people. You wouldn't love people. You wouldn't care if you offended them. You wouldn't care if, if, if you lived that way because it doesn't bug you at all. Then I would worry. I would worry then. But of course you won't worry because you don't care. And so you really aren't a believer. See, But the fact that you do and you notice it in your own life is evident that you are. And so you just need to use the tools that God has given you by praying and asking for help to do the right thing. The Philistines will be judged. Thus says the Lord, behold, waters rise out of the north. Again, waters, army, and he's speaking of Babylon at this time. And shall be an overflowing flood. They shall overflow the land and all that is in it, the cities and those who dwell in it. Then the men shall cry and all the inhabitants of the land shall wail. At the noise of the stomping hooves of his strong horses, at the rushing of his chariots, at the rumbling of his wheels, the fathers will not look back for their children, lacking courage. Wow. That's going to be difficult. The father's literally so fearful. Forget you, son. Sorry, I'm running out of here. Reminds me of that, that little joke of those two guys that were out in the forest and they were fishing and having a great time. And then all of a sudden, a bear comes out of the woods and he's screaming and yelling. And both the guys look at each other. What do we do? What do we do? He goes, I don't know about you, but all I have to do is outrun you. <laughs> right? Because then the bear will eat him. Remember another one where where a bear uh, was chasing a guy and finally caught him. The guy's going, please, God, please, God, save me, save me, save me. Just make the bear a Christian. Please, Lord, make him a Christian. And the bear got him and got him down and so forth, put him on the ground. And all of a sudden the bear goes, oh, let me pray before I eat you. <laughs> Men lacking courage that they leave. The, that's hard to imagine, right? It's hard to imagine. Can you imagine Roman leaving Luke? Can you imagine you leaving your, your children behind, Gabby, you know, any of your children? Just, that's hard to imagine. But the fear was so great at this army, he just ran. Because of that day that comes to plunder all the Philistines, to cut off from Tymir, Siddim, every helper who remains, for the Lord shall plunder the Philistines, a remnant of the country of Kephthor. Baldness has come upon Gaza. Ashkelon is cut off with the remnant of their valley. How long will you cut yourself? Now that was a ritual that came with uh, false worship, was cutting yourself. That was demonic. Now, 
Interesting that we still see it to this day when our youth cut themselves. Very demonic thing. It comes from Satan himself trying to destroy your your own self. I don't know. I don't know if it has. It, it may well have. You know, part of getting them into whatever it is they go. Um, I'm sure it had to do with a lot of. Uh, whether someone dying or whether it's keeping people from dying or whether it was keeping their land blessed and so forth. So it was a way of them appeasing their gods. Kind of like what John said in First John about our God, that we appease him, that Jesus appeased our God by his offering. So he became the appeasement of God's wrath. And that's basically why these other nations did it falsely. They would cut themselves to appease their gods for whatever reasons. Verse six, O you sword of the Lord, how long will until you are quiet? Put yourself up into your, uh, I can't pronounce that word, rest and be still. How, should, how can it be quiet? Seeing the Lord has given it a charge against uh, Ascalon and against the sea shores. There he has appointed it. So we close up these chapters and it just continues on from chapter 48. Unfortunately, the chapters are long, so so um, we'll probably be hitting one chapter at a time again. <clears throat> Judgment isn't always a great topic to talk about because we don't like talking about it. And, and I think I've we've experienced that here in this church recently <laughs> with all that's going on in the world. Um, but we can't keep our heads in the, in the ground. We, we have to be aware of it at all times. We shouldn't fear it, but we should know that it is coming and, and one day it's going to be here at an hour that we don't know when. And so we need to just constantly be walking with the Lord. And we have loved ones and we have friends and we have people even from this church that have walked away They've walked away and they are now, like Peter says, they, they're like dogs who return back to the vomit, to their old life. And that's sad that they would do that, especially coming to this church because I have been very clear about all those things and yet they still made the choice to do that. You know what that tells me? That tells me either they really don't believe it, they really don't believe it, or they don't care. And they're going to try to live and have as much fun as, as they can. You're only hurting yourself. Do you really believe this word? That's my question. I'll leave that with you. Do you really believe this? Do you really believe it? Every part of it, from Genesis to Revelation, is it the truth? And is it something that we can rely on? Is it something that we should live our lives after? Ask yourself, do I really believe it? Because if you really do believe it, then you will follow it. You will live by it. It will become your manual for life. And it will keep you safe 110% of the time. But you've got to be in it. And you've got to understand it. So I encourage you to really seek the Lord. And ask Him to reveal to you that it is His Word. And that you can depend on it.